the key for me to creativity, to learning, is to listen. We know that music has this remarkable ability to, to regulate our moods and to connect us with each other. Every young people, regardless of their socioeconomic background, should have access to free music education in their schools and in their communities. Right now, our children and young people, they need hope, they need inspiration more than ever. Each of the contributions to this conversation about culture and education makes the case for why and how culture should play an important role in all our lives, and particularly in the educational opportunities of children, to the cognitive development of the brain from early childhood, to a sense of health and well-being throughout our lives, to the impact of creativity on our economic prosperity, and to the empathy and emotional awareness that is such an essential part of the welfare of every human society. Members of youth orchestras in California and Scotland, together with a neuroscientist, an epidemiologist, an economist, and an educational entrepreneur, each make a uniquely powerful argument for cultural engagement as an essential element to enlarge the circumstances in which we are able to imagine our lives. What our speakers have to say reminds me of Howard Gardner, whose pioneering work with young children led him to observe multiple forms of human capacity or creativity, and to assert that intelligence is not single-minded, but multifaceted. Our artistic capacity is unique to our species. To ignore or diminish its development undermines our whole being. My name is Asal Habibi. I'm an assistant research professor of psychology at the Brain and Creativity Institute at the University of Southern California. My training and background is in neuroscience and in psychology. I'm generally interested to better understand human behavior and learn about the brain. Um, I use a variety of methods and techniques like magnetic resonance imaging, MRI, and electroencephalography and behavioral assessments to better learn and understand uh, underlying brain circuits uh, of human behavior. One of the research programs of my lab that we've been focusing on the past few years is understanding the relationship between music and the brain and how learning music can make changes, neuroplastic changes in the underlying systems of the brain and how does it help with enhancing skills such as um, cognitive development, social development, and emotional development. We unfortunately live in a world that children are um, faced with many stresses. We know that, the stresses like war and uh, climate change and violence uh, and the current pandemic, obviously. And uh, of course, we do have to all work together collectively to reduce and um, uh, to work to solve and resolve some of these problems. but. Another thing that we could do is to give children a toolbox to respond to these stresses better, to have more resiliency towards uh, in face of these uh, circumstances. And I think that music is one of these tools that can help children regulate their emotion, their mood, and to respond better in stressful circumstances. So that's kind of the work that I presented partly at the Scottish Parliament last time I was there. I talked about a study that we have been doing since 2012 at the Brain and Creativity Institute at USC um, with, in collaboration with the Los Angeles Philharmonic and their youth orchestra program, YOLA. And this study was uh, really manifested from the idea that despite the fact that we have about two decades or so of evidence of the importance of music training for children and adults, there is still this decline of music education programs around the world and, and specifically for us in California and in the States. So we wanted to put our efforts together to specifically look at children as they are growing up, as they're developing, how does music training systematically affect their development. YOLA Youth Orchestra Los Angeles is the LA Phil's leading education and community program. Um, it was founded back in 2007, and since then we've had the honor to engage with thousands of students and families. And today, YOLA is part of the LA Phil's DNA, and it's, it's one of the ways that we 
um, uh, work on our mission as a nonprofit organization and as a community resource. And Yola provides young people ages five through 18 with free instruments, free instrumental instruction, both in school and after school, up to 12 to 18 hours each week. Um, academic supports, college preparation, but also leadership training and opportunities to perform on stages in the community and around the world. And YOLA is a positive and creative youth development program that's dedicated exclusively to youth from low-income families and from under-resourced communities where access to music education continues to be limited. As an organization by ourselves, we cannot make societal change happen. Um, so we, uh, what we can do is we can help provide evidence um, about the impact of intensive music instruction and youth development in um, under-resourced communities. So doing that um, uh, with a, a leading research institute like um, the Brain and Creativity Institute at USC is a really unique opportunity. What we have observed is that not only children got better with their musical skills, but we observed differences in abilities that are not directly related to music. So for example, we observed that the auditory systems of their brain uh, are maturing faster. And these systems of the brain um, that are involved in auditory perception, although they are important for music and they are stimulated by music, um, but they're also important for any other skill that involves sound. The very first systems of the brain that started to change were those auditory systems that I talked about earlier. But as time went by, we began to see changes in what we call far transfer effect. So not skills that are changing, that are not directly uh, practiced during music training. What uh, a set of skills that we call executive function. Executive functions are skills um, such as working memory, task switching, inhibition, that have been shown to be very important, not only for everyday success, but also they're actually very good predictors of uh, future success, well-being, health, even academic success in the future. So one of these skills, for example, that we have um, been exploring is the ability to control impulses, what we call delayed gratification. So for example, uh, waiting for a better reward in future, letting go of an immediate reward right now for a better or larger reward in future. And we have observed that children who have had music training are better in this task. They are more willing to wait for a better reward at a later time than wanting to have a smaller immediate reward right now. Uh, this is really a, a, a skill that when you go to learn music, you don't, practice, you don't necessarily practice that, but it's really coming as part of that discipline of having to sit and play measure by measure and work with others. In terms of uh, giving feedback, getting feedback from their parents, so as I said, we interview the families um, to better understand uh, how the music training is impacting the family unit as a whole. And although all the parents at the beginning, both the music group and non-music group, sort of rated their children um, equally in terms of their behavior. As time went by and children were involved in the YOLA program, we observed that parents of children who have had music training tend to say that their children are less aggressive, less hyperactive, and they're more compassionate. They want to make friendship with their siblings, with their friends. So it's easier to have them around both from a social and emotional perspective. So Systema Scotland essentially is about using music as a tool and long-term, deep-rooted relationships with communities to be able to use all of the transferable skills that come with learning music, that come with being part of a collective effort, that using the orchestra as a tool within the community to bring children together, to bring families together, and to bring inspiration, hope, ambition, and all of the transferable skills that children, young people and families learn from, being, from learning an instrument, from being part of an orchestra. We see a huge impact on their confidence, an impact on their well-being, many transferable skills for learning. And those really um, begin early, but they become more and more consolidated the longer the children and young people stay in the programme. But also we see impact on their families and people around about them. So we've had a lot of feedback and evaluation from parents, from carers 
And from that network of people round about, the children and young people and within the community. I know that many, many schools around the world face budget cuts. For example, just in California in the last decade when we had increase in children's population, student population at school about 6%, one of the items in the curricula that really got a very sharp cut was music. Uh, music uh, education declined by about 50%. So the number of students to music teacher just increased. And, and it's, it's understandable that when um, school administrators are faced with these very sharp budget cuts and there's this emphasis on STEM uh, and science education, science and math, and I am not by any means saying that we should take budget off science. Uh, I'm a scientist by training, but I think it's really important to have this insight that from everything I said, there needs to be investment in music and art education. And we cannot just leave it to the, to the school administrator to just leave it or have it. If you have time, just add it. It has, there has to be policies uh, and, and resources available to bring back art education, and especially in the current times. I'm, I'm very much aware of the economic uh, circumstances and limitation of resources, but this is the time to bring music and art back to children's life, uh, have that available to them, because not only it's good for their development in terms of their cognitive skills, their executive function skills, the skills that we want them to develop, but also it's hugely giving them a, a tool to respond to the current stress. Hello everyone, I'm Gustavo Dudamel, and um, I'm so happy you know, to be connected with you. Even if we cannot be together you know, physically, we have the chance to be connected online. And this is such an important, you know, thing of what is music and how important is music, you know, for the world and for our new generations. Music, as I always said, is a fundamental human right. Access for our children to learn music, to learn art, to learn their culture is the most important thing. I'm so happy that our kids in Yola and also our kids in Big Noise in Scotland are getting together and making this beautiful dream happen. I wish you all the best and I send you all my love. <laughs>associate professor of psychobiology and epidemiology at university college london and my area of research is how social factors affect health so this includes things like loneliness social isolation 
and also social, cultural and community engagement, including engagement with the arts, culture and broader heritage activities. So I run a research team where we're interested in how these different activities affect different health outcomes, including helping to prevent the incidence of mental and physical illness and help in the management or recovery for people from these conditions. Across 2018 and 2019, I worked with the World Health Organization on um, a report which looked at what the evidence is for the links between arts and cultural engagement and health outcomes. And we reviewed the findings from over 3000 studies, which showed a remarkable amount of data on how the arts affect us. Now, some of these effects were seen in terms of broader determinants of health and health promotion. So for example, we were finding that engagement in the arts uh, was associated uh, with differences such as uh, higher understanding of different types of health conditions. The arts could be playing a role in things like health communication. They could be helping to reduce stigma around health conditions and playing a role in supporting health and social care workers. But we also looked at how they could actually help in the prevention and management of illness. And what we found here was that at different stages of the life course, we see different effects on people's mental and physical health. So for example, in uh, early years, we find that the arts can actually help with things such as uh, the management of premature birth. Infants who listen to music are likely to gain weight faster and be able to leave hospital sooner through reductions in physiological stress whilst being in intensive care settings. We see that the arts can help with things such as speech and language development and play a role in supporting children's education. We also find that the arts across childhood and adolescence and into adulthood are associated with better mental health. So for example, a lower risk of developing depression or anxiety and better management of these conditions when they do occur. And they're also linked with higher levels of well-being, with self-esteem, with purpose in life. We're also finding increasing evidence about how arts engagement is linked in with healthier living. We find that people who engage in the arts are also more likely to engage in other health promoting behaviours and they're less likely to engage in risky behaviours, whether risky sexual behaviours or behaviours such as alcohol and drug use. We also see that uh, engagement in the arts can be linked via different biological pathways with uh, things like inflammation, stress hormones, and that these then link through to the risk of developing conditions like cardiovascular disease. As people age, we start to see more associations uh, with healthy aging. So for example, engaging in things like dance is associated with better bone strength, better physical fitness. We see engagement in broad arts and cultural activities associated with a lower incidence of frailty and a slower progression of frailty. There are lots of associations between the arts and better cognitive functioning. Slower rates of cognitive decline have even been proposed. And we also find that people who develop dementia are actually better able to manage their uh, dementia symptoms and also likely to have a higher quality of life. There's also a crucial role for the arts in end of life care and in bereavement. And if we zoom back out again, we're also finding that the arts have a really important role within society in terms of supporting social bonding, reducing loneliness, helping with social cohesion. We see this on small scales with individuals or small groups, but also at a larger societal level where there's evidence about how the arts can help in things like conflict between different groups. And there's also interesting emerging evidence on health and social inequalities and about how the arts can be used to try and provide opportunities for individuals who might be considered normally more at risk for health and social challenges across the life course. So altogether, this data prevent, uh, paints a very rich picture about the role that the arts can play. And crucially, it seems that the arts don't have just one or two different mechanisms by which they affect us. We've mapped over 600 different mechanisms, including psychological, biological, social and behavioural pathways by which the arts are linked with these different mental and physical health outcomes. Historically, one of the key ways that children have engaged in the arts is via schools. And this is really important because we know that when children engage in the arts, they're much more likely to then continue to engage in the arts as adults. But what we've actually found is that another reason that school engagement in the arts is so critical is because we actually know that in, if we look at arts engagement outside of school settings, there can be quite a strong social gradient. In other words, it really depends on children's parents and families as to whether the children will engage in the arts outside of school. This is driven primarily by things such as previous uh, uh, arts experience from parents themselves, but also things like economic circumstances. However, within schools, this is a perfect opportunity to level the playing field and make sure that all children have access.
So I'm the chief economist uh, at the Bank of England. That's the, the UK's central bank. And as my job title suggests, I mean, the core part of the job is trying to understand the economy. What are the key drivers of the economy? What are the key sectors for generating wealth and job creation uh, in the economy? And of course, those, those factors and those sectors are many and various. Um, but one of the, I'd say, increasingly important of those sectors has been the creative industries sector. I mean, one way of keeping score on that will be to look at this thing called GDP, the amount of value created in the economy. If you look at the value created by the creative industry sector here in the UK, that would be about 100 billion pounds each year. That's a chunky amount. That's what 5% of the total amount of value created across the UK economy. But of course, I mean, a key point is that that is just really the tip of the iceberg when it comes to really understanding the virtue and the value created by culture, the virtue and value created by the creative industry sector. And the reason I say that is because measures like GDP don't capture any of the non-financial, non-pecuniary benefits that we know are right at the core of the culture sector. We know from all sorts of research and evidence just how much extra well-being, how much happiness is generated by cultural activities of various types. That could be theatre, it could be music, it could be sport. These are among the activities that we know generate the largest amounts of personal happiness. The wellspring of wealth creation and the wellspring of well-being, that is a common source. And that common source, that secret source, uh, is imagination and is creativity. It's the capacity to imagine, to envision a different way of doing things. And then crucially, to set about creating that imagined world. That has been the means by which we've driven forward societies and driven forward economies for many, many millennia. Well, in terms of uh, means by which we can do a, a better job of, of uh, unearthing this secret source called creativity, um, I mean, one means uh, of doing that is uh, at the very earliest stage. You, we know from the evidence that, that people, um, on, some of the t on some of the measures, you know, people's levels of creativity peak, they peak before they reach the age of 10. Uh, and that's telling us something very important uh, about uh, our educational system. Um, we know that one of the crucial factors uh, in stimulating and driving creativity is the capacity to experiment, to try and to fail and to learn from having failed when you try next time. And the current um, way we structure our schooling and educational system is not well disposed to failure. Uh, the exam system that's at the root of our educational system strongly discourages experimentation, risk-taking, and above all else, failure. Again, and a second um, well-known driver of the creative process is the capacity to take ideas from one discipline, such as epidemiology, and apply it to another discipline, let's say economics. So a curriculum that is overtly cross-disciplinary, I think could also serve as much more fertile soil among both younger people and indeed older ones when it comes to nurturing the, the creative instinct, the creative muscle. Because of creativity, of course, is very far from being God-given. It's something we can be taught. 
It's a muscle we can develop. It's an instinct we can spot. But it can only play that role if it is a muscle that you you exercise regularly. Uh, and that's why reform educationally, from cradle to grave, I think is so crucial as one element in a creative transformation. A very big part of who I am, it's very much connected to what my father went through as a survivor of the Dachau concentration camp, as a survivor of the Holocaust. What we're experiencing in our world today is a renaissance and revival of racism, of anti-Semitism, of division, of polarization, of hatred, of distrust of the other, of ignorance. There just seems to be so much ruthlessness in our world. Now more than ever, I feel like my role has to be not just to build bridges, but to encourage those tough conversations where people learn to truly listen, not to those who they agree with, but to those who they disagree with in a constructive way, uh, in order for us to build some bonds of respect that are sustainable and, and real. Empatico is a platform that allows classrooms to expand their children's horizons and it allows children to discover the experiences and humanity of other kids that are very different from themselves. So you might have kids in Nigeria connecting to kids in Delaware or kids in Memphis, Tennessee in an all black school connecting to kids in Southern New Jersey in an all white school or kids in a rural school in Northwest Arkansas connecting to kids in Paris. And the whole concept of Empatico is to help expose kids at a critical time in their lives when they're discovering their role in the world and their sense of self. During those critical years, your parents or your school or your role models or your environment start teaching you to be very proud of who you are and where you come from, but to also be proud of being a human being and recognize that we have a lot in common. It's much more likely that then for the rest of your life, you're gonna carry that perspective and help you not just be a better citizen of the world, but also more effective in life. So one thing that's important to understand about Empatico is that it allows you to have a free-form conversation where the teachers and the students just have a free-for-all, but it also has modules so that kids can discover each other's humanity through a common language. And so you can learn about each other's weather, you can learn about uh, mathematical experience, but the most popular by far is using culture, how we celebrate different things, because all kids can appreciate that we all have certain traditions, that we have certain festivities, that we have certain cultural aspects in our lives. And so culture is a central uh, organizing, welcoming platform for our children when we use Empathico. And it's a very, very important tool because all human beings can connect to that and can be enriched by it. If I were asked by culture ministers what I would recommend that we do in terms of strengthening our children to become better citizens uh, and, and more effective people in their lives, my advice would be to foster social emotional learning, to help kids become critical thinkers and critical listeners by both developing their empathetic muscle and their values uh, in order to make sure that they fight against racism of all types, but also to help foster in them a hearty culture that welcomes respectful disagreement. I think one of the reasons why we are moving into more and more extremism and we don't value sufficiently the art of moderation, of living in the gray rather than the absolutes black or white, left or right, you know, I think we don't teach our children enough and our society enough to be listeners to the other side and to create the space for disagreement. We're all so uncomfortable with disagreement that then we shun it in favor of simple labels. And I find that extraordinarily dangerous coming from the far left and from the far right I think 
our society and our world is moving more and more and more into the extremes. And what I would encourage all of us to do is to try to build critical thinkers and critical listeners that can live in the nuances, that can appreciate that our, we live in a nuanced world, that it's much harder to find an absolute monster as a human being, much easier to find an imperfect human being that is not perfect. They're not heroes and monsters. There are some, but for the most part, we're all perfectly imperfect. And what we need to do is just learn how to deal with each other, with those imperfections, how to listen to each other, how to be comfortable in that discomfort and allow people to ask questions that might be uncomfortable so that we can have a rich conversation and truly get to a place of consensus.